Now Monitor brings you Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence E. Spivak. Ready for the spontaneous unrehearsed conference are four of America's top news reporters. Their questions do not necessarily reflect their point of view, but may be their way of getting a story for you. And now, here is the moderator of Meet the Press, Ned Brooks. Welcome once again to Meet the Press. Our guest is Mr. Tom Mboya, one of the top leaders of the Movement for Independence in Africa and the outstanding political figure in his home state of Kenya. Africa is rapidly emerging as one of the great forces in the world, and its struggle for freedom and economic development have attracted the attention of both the East and the West. Mr. Mboya has just come to this country under the sponsorship of the American Committee on Africa. He is helping to launch Freedom Day to be celebrated all over the world next Wednesday. Mr. Mboya is 28 years old, the son of a plantation laborer who earned one British pound a month. He was educated in Catholic mission schools and he had one year at Oxford University. He helped to organize the first union of government employees at a time when followers of the independence movement were being subjected to wholesale arrests. In 1953 he was elected as the general secretary of the Kenya Federation of Labor, a post which he still holds. In 1957, he became the first African to be elected to the Legislative Council of Kenya. He also served as the chairman of the first All-African People's Conference held last year in the new state of Ghana. And now seated around the press table, ready to interview Mr. Mboya, are Pauline Frederick of NBC News, Stuart Hensley of United Press International, May Craig of the Portland Maine Press Herald, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular member of the Meet the Press panel. And that was a chair that fell over. <laughs> now, Mr. Mboya, if you're ready, sir, we'll start the questions with Mr. Spivak. Uh, Mr. Mboya, as I understand it, uh, one of the reasons for your visit to the United States this time is to begin a worldwide African Freedom Fund campaign. Is that true? Yes, this is true. This is one of the purposes of my visit. Is there any assurance that you can give, Mr. Mboya, that the money that is collected for this fund will be used solely for peaceful purposes and not for arms? Yes, I can do that because the All African People's Conference at its Accra uh, meeting in December resolved after very, very uh, lengthy discussions that our struggle shall be waged in a non-violent, peaceful, but positive action. We hope that the situation in Africa will be such that we can pursue this policy of non-violence, positive action, without the need for any of our people in their uh, impatience or um, as a result of conditions created by colonial powers to revert to any other methods, we strongly and sincerely believe in nonviolent positive action. But in the very statement you have just made, you don't rule out the possibility of violence, do you? You say that is how you would like it, but you suggest that if necessary, violence will be used. I do not suggest that violence will be used. All I'm saying is that it is necessary for people to be realistic, to recognize that the question as to whether violence is used or not used is not entirely dependent merely on the attitude of the African nationalist leaders. The colonial powers, their attitude and their response to our methods is also an important factor. Well, if violence is started by the other side, is there any possibility that the money collected from the, for the African Freedom Fund would be used to counter violence? I do not think that that would be possible. Our office has objectives which have already been set out. These are to help in such things as uh, money to, uh, for the defense in the trial of people arrested, such as we have cases now, in Nyasaland, 
in the Rhodesias, we have the treason trial in South Africa, and also to help in purely organizational efforts. Mrs. Craig. Well, Mr. Mboyam, uh, it's small for, it's hard for small nations to live alone. Do you hope for your country a federation with other small African, middle African nations? What is it that you want for the future? The All African People's Conference discussed this whole question of federations or a United States of Africa. And we are being realistic in this matter by our decision at Accra that certain regions constitute workable units that might be treated together in terms of economic planning, in terms of various social or economic uh, programs, and also with the hope that in uh, trying to achieve this, certain political units could be created. We have as a long-term objective the possibility of a United States of Africa. Would you affiliate with the Arabs or the northern half of Africa? In our present um, attitude, we regard that countries like Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, the Sudan, which I, I think you are referring to, are part of Africa. And consequently, uh, it is quite possible that um, a workable unit could be created in the north, and which later on would probably associate with other units yes. in the rest of Africa. Yes. You have said that you would offer Europeans the hand of friendship. Well, I believe at the Accra meeting uh, in December, you said Europeans should scram out of Africa. Now, what did you mean by that? I am very glad that you raised this point, because I think it is often difficult for us to be uh, sure that we are correctly reported. And I want to take this opportunity to say exactly what I said. I said at Accra that in contrast to the, 90, uh, to the 1884 Berlin Conference, the Accra Conference was convened to unite Africa to create the African community. And whereas the Berlin Conference started what history has referred to as the scramble for Africa, in Accra we were meeting to state in definite terms to the colonial powers, not European individuals, to the colonial powers that they would have to scram out of Africa. I have also heard you reported as saying that you are not for Africa for Africans only, that all would be equal before the law. Is that true? This is true, except I want to qualify that statement by saying, whereas Africa for Africans is quite uh, a logical and uh, a satisfactory phrase to use. The qualification is that it is dependent on one's definition of African. Now, so long as the definition of African includes any person, regardless of his color, who has decided to make Africa his home, I do not see why anyone should quarrel with us. And I want to submit that when Europeans emigrate to Australia, they call themselves Australians. When they emigrate to Canada, they are quite content to be called Canadians. I see no reason why they should be ashamed to be called Africans. Mr. Hensley. Uh, well, Mr. Mboya, you uh, want more self-government in Kenya. And yet you and 14 other Africans who were elected to the Legislative Council have not taken your seats. Uh, what's the explanation of that? I'm sure there must be one. Yes, there is, but I think first the information is not quite correct. We were elected in March 1957. We took our seats in the legislature, by, but decided to boycott the Council of Ministers, which was to show our dissatisfaction with the Constitution. We worked within the legislature until January this year. Within that time, we tried every means possible within the legislature to secure certain changes in the constitution of our country. These legislative council measures failed. We have carried our 
rejection or our objections or uh, dissatisfaction further by now boycotting the legislature and hoping that this is yet another means of applying pressure on the British government to bring about the changes that we want. Well, Mr. Mboya, when you get yourself government, if and when you get yourself government, what do you want? Do you want independence within the British, uh, the British Commonwealth, or do you want to break clear outside as Burma did? Uh, with due respect, I want to suggest that it is not a question of if we get our self-government. We're quite certain of getting it. But when we get our self-government, at the moment, our view is that we should be with, remain within the British Commonwealth. We see no reason uh, at the moment why we should uh, try to get out of it. Well, that brings up another question. The British have troops in Kenya, and I think it's no secret, Lennox Boyd once said, that Britain regarded uh, Malta, Gibraltar, and Kenya as fortress colonies. And part of her plan apparently envisaged airlift of troops from Kenya to the Persian Gulf area in case of trouble there. Now, after you are independent but within the Commonwealth, would you be willing to permit Britain to retain some bases there for the general protection of the area and for your own protection against whatever predatoryism might be loose or not? We are strongly opposed to the establishment of any British military base in Kenya. We do not believe that these bases are necessary. In fact, in our view, as far as a world war is concerned, uh, these bases would be useless. As far as being used for limited uh, action in the Middle East or other areas, we see no reason why our country should be used in situations which are, in our view, the uh, result of British uh, uh, lack of insight into the colonial problems. We think that these things can be solved in other ways. We don't want to be parties to British colonialism. Well, do you think that British lack of insight into colonialism raises the danger of Soviet penetration of the Middle East? Is that what you're getting at? I think so. I think that most countries have been very unrealistic in their dealings with the colonial countries, and especially in their attitude to the whole question of communism. Mr. Frederick. Mr. Mboy, you've spoken a great deal about freedom for people of Africa. What is your definition of freedom? We are struggling in Africa to free ourselves from colonialism. In other words, we want in our countries to have the right to self-determination, to have a government elected by our people, responsible to our people, and accountable to our people. In other words, you recognize that along with freedom, there goes responsibility for self-government. Now, how can you say that people are prepared for such responsibility when illiteracy in many parts of Africa is as high as 90%? when governmental experience, personally, from many people, is tribal, and when a major de the major dependence for foreign help, for economic development, is um, the major dependence for economic development comes from outside. How can you say that people with this background are ready for self-government? This question exposes the fallacy of the arguments used by colonial powers and other people because it starts off with an assumption, an assumption that independence must be based on certain standards defined by certain people according to their own ideas of what self-government should mean and what administrative ability should mean. The African recognizes the need for literacy, the need for development, and the need for advancement. And in fact, the motive power behind our struggle for independence is our recognition that these things are not possible under colonialism. And experience everywhere has shown that it's only when people have attained independence that programs such as more education, more hospitals, better roads, and better houses can be implemented by a government that is concerned with the welfare of the people. 
Mr. Amboya, you're regarded as a young man in a hurry, and in, 20, in 29 years you've accomplished a great deal. What is the rush at this particular moment for uh, independence for these countries? Aren't you just stirring up a chauvinism, an emotional situation that could be terribly dangerous because these people are really not ready for self-government? Are we really in a rush? You see... What, what is your target then? What are your target dates for, for independence? I don't believe we are in a rush. I think people forget that we are living with them in the 20th century. They think we are living in the 19th century. They think we should live in the 19th century and they in the 20th century. That's the, the problem. Our target for independence is that we should be free now. We believe that we have a right to be free. We've always had the right. You mean all countries in Africa, all, all areas in Africa should be free now? All areas in the world should be free now. To govern themselves. To govern themselves. Mr. Spivak. Uh, Mr. Mboy, according to a recent dispatch in the Herald Tribune, you warn that Africa might become communist if the Western powers do not help introduce true democracy for the African people. Is that correct? Did you so warn? I warned that the Western powers must take full responsibility for the loss of Africa to communism or any other ism. Because the loss of Africa will have meant that democracy has failed. If democracy has failed, surely it is those nations that preach democracy, but fail to practice democracy, that must take the responsibility. Well, Mr. Mboya, is there any question in your mind or the minds of any intelligent leader in Africa that they will not get freedom and democracy from communism? I mean, how can a, a groups of nations who want freedom and want democracy think at all of moving in the direction of communism? <clears throat> Our position is not that we are thinking of moving towards communism. On the contrary, I want to suggest very strongly that Africa has too much in common with the West, voluntarily and, uh, and deliberately, to move towards <laughs> communism. All I am saying is that all these problems have to be looked at from a human point of view. We have problems in our country. Disease, poverty, ignorance, and many other problems. Our task is to try and remove these problems as fast as possible. Oh, but if your people, as you say, are intelligent and are ready for freedom, how can they think in terms of communism when the communists have crushed freedom out wherever they've been, in their own country of the Soviet Union, in China, uh, in all the satellite states. Don't your people know this? Don't your leaders know this? How can there be danger of communism there? Our leaders know this very well. And our people realize these things. But I think we've got to be realistic. In a country, people want certain things. We as leaders have the task if we are to continue as leaders, of meeting these desires as quickly as possible. I think, and I, I am quite sure that this applies equally to an American as it does to an African, that unless a government or a leadership of a country is able to meet the tasks and the challenge of the day, it is not inconceivable that this leadership loses the confidence and probably the control of the people and that some opportunists are likely to exploit such situation. Mm -hmm. And I see no reason why communists may not try to exploit this situation. I think that is the danger. Yes, but, but isn't the responsibility on you, on you leaders uh, for telling your people what the West and what democracy does vis-a-vis -vis communism, 
Why, for example, do you, as you have, endorse neutralism and non-alignment? If you wish the West to align itself with you, why don't you align yourself with the West? I entirely agree with you that it's the task of us, the leaders, to tell our people what all these things mean. But I think you'll agree with me that it is not enough merely for us to tell our people what these things mean. We have also got to deliver the goods sometime. And the question is whether, in our efforts to deliver the goods, the West cooperates with us in trying to achieve this objective. The policy of the African nations of non-alignment or neutralism should not be interpreted as meaning neutralism in terms of ideology. It is neutralism in this sense that in the United Nations, for example, we do not have to vote for some resolution just because America has sponsored it, nor do we have to oppose some resolution just because the Russians have sponsored it. We want to have the freedom to decide on the merits of each individual case as to whether we should or should not support the issue. Well, you've been highly critical of the colonialism of the Western powers. Will you tell us what your attitude is toward the Soviet brand of colonialism? I'll be very frank. I am critical and against colonialism of the British, the Belgian, the Portuguese, and the French. I am equally against the colonialism of Russia or any other power. I stand against the French in Algeria just as much as I oppose the Russians in Hungary. Mrs. Craig. Yeah. Mr. Amboya, there's been criticism of American racial intolerance, but is there not now intolerance of the whites, however justified, in Africa? I do not think that there is an intolerance of the whites in Africa. I think, again, that the situation, the two situations are not parallel. In Africa, the problem is the whites themselves. They are afraid. They are caught between uh, fear and realism. They think that when we come to power, we shall start victimizing them, and that we shall be vindictive in our policies. My submission is that it is in our own self-interest not to be vindictive. How can we who hope to receive help from America, from Britain, for our economic and social programs and projects, afford to be is, vindictive and victimize the white people in our own societies. Is there a chance that Mau Mau will rise again, perhaps when Mr. Kangata gets out of jail next year? I do not think so. Hmm. And again, I think it is not fair for people to say that Kenyatta is going to revive Mau Mau if he is freed. Recent evidence in a trial of one of the witnesses in his case has revealed what we regard as conclusive evidence that something was wrong with the trial. Mr. Hensley. Well, Mr. Amboya. The, with regard to these white minorities who wrongly, as you put it, feel that you might victimize them when you get your way, uh, are you prepared to offer them any sort of safeguards so that you can keep the flow of Western capital and technicians that you need coming into Kenya? Is there anything more for them than your one man, one vote theory? I hope I'm quoting you correctly on that. Well, certainly. In our statements, we offered the settlers what we consider is the maximum that we can offer them. We offered last year that during the transitional period from the present stage to independence, there could be an arrangement whereby there would be special representation provided for certain interests within the legislature in addition to their enjoying equal citizenship rights with us. In other words, 
the privileged group in the country will still be the European settlers. What we have said we cannot compromise on is the exclusive reservation of the land in the, in the Kenya Highlands to Europeans or segregation in schools, segregation in hospitals, or uh, race discrimination in the civil service and in job opportunities. Ms. Frederick. Mr. Mboya, have the American seg uh, desegregation difficulties had any in any way affected the prestige and influence of the United States in Africa? This has been very bad publicity for the United States, of course. And as a country that uh, preaches democracy, stands for democracy, naturally it has raised doubts in the minds of many of our people as to the good intentions, the sincerity, uh, and the motives of, of the United States. Another thing is that colonial powers are only too ready to use this sort of publicity to prove that whereas they are wrong, they are not the only people who are always wrong. You indicated the other day that uh, you would need a great deal of help from the outside and particularly from the United States in your program. What do you expect from the United States in the way, shall we say, of economic help? Well, I think this is a very important question and I see it is coming right at the end. I want just to say that we expect that the United States government should be ready and willing to give as much help to our independent states in their efforts to uh, develop their, the, 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 the economies of the country, um, either through the United Nations and its other agencies, and also through its own governmental effort. Mr. Mboya, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to interrupt. Thank you very much, Mr. Mboya, for being with us. We will return to Meet the Press in just a moment. Our thanks to Tom Mboya, a member of Kenya's Legislative Council and General Secretary of the Kenya Federation of Labor and the members of the panel for a stimulating and enlightening half hour. Meet the Press is produced by Lawrence E. Spivak. Now a personal word, if I may. Do you realize that every time you invest in a United States Series H savings bond, you're actually buying a share in America? You become a stockholder in the United States government. You help provide the strength and resources on which so much depends, not only for us, but for future generations of Americans. Your money helps to strengthen America's peace power and helps to make that peace a lasting one through science and education. And what do you get from your Series H bonds? Well, while your money is working for your country, it's also working for you. For every six months, twice a year, for ten years, until your bonds reach maturity, you get your interest paid to you by United States government checks, and at the end of those ten years, you receive an average annual interest of three and one quarter percent. So you see, as a stockholder in America, you earn while you save, and you help your country maintain its peace. Series H bonds are a wise investment towards your future and the future of America. Five minutes and... This is Monitor, the NBC Weekend Radio Service.